Welcome to Pals. It's from Sanyamu's Anatomy Lecture Series. In this place, our goal is to make anatomy simple. If you're just joining us or you have not subscribed, we'd like you to subscribe now and be part of this amazing anatomy family where we make anatomy simple. This is the part one in our series of lectures on the posterior abdominal region. In this section, we'll be discussing the extent, boundaries, components of this region. We'll focus on the muscles covering this region. So let's go to class. So this is the posterior aspect of the abdominal cavity. That's the region of focus in this our lecture. And here in the two images we have, this is the region we call the posterior abdominal region. It covers part of the abdominal cavity proper and even incorporates part of the pelvic cavity. So here also we are seeing the posterior abdominal region with some of the contents. This region lies posterior to the gastrointestinal tract as well as the spleen, pancreas and other associated organs. Here we are seeing part of the kidney and then the major vessels in this region, as you can notice here. The next thing we'll look at in this topic is the extent of posterior abdominal region. This region will extend from the 12th rib above to the pelvic brim below. In this pelvic brim, we're looking at the region of the fourth lumbar vertebra. So let's look at our image again. Here we're seeing the colored area. This is the 12th rib, which is the proximal limit of the posterior abdominal wall. And then here we are seeing the iliac bone. And then this region I'm touching is the pelvic brim. So the extent of the posterior abdominal region is from this proximal landmark here, the 12th rib, to the distal landmark here, the pelvic brim, which is at the level of L4. We will next consider the boundaries, and in discussing the boundaries, we will be looking at four major boundaries, and these boundaries are the anterior, posterior, superior, and inferior. We will start with the anterior boundary. So where my light is running is the anterior boundary. So here is the anterior boundary, and also this forms the anterior boundary. So this boundary is actually seen marked by the anterolateral abdominal muscles, I will also notice some retroperitoneal organs that we see marking this boundary. Also, we see the layers of the peritoneum. Now, posteriorly, we see other structures, and the posterior boundaries will be the lumbar vertebra. We are seeing a little at this point with the muscles covering these regions. From here, we are seeing some of the muscles we soon name. Here is Suez Major and the rest of the muscles and fascia. So for posteriorly, we'll be looking at the lumbar vertebra, the muscles lining this region, and the fascia wrapping the muscles. Next, we'll consider the superior boundary. Now, superiorly, remember we talked about the 12th rib, and at that point, we'll be seeing part of the diaphragm. So in this image, we're looking at the diaphragm forming the superior boundary. And then the inferior boundary, we also remember we are talking about the pelvic brim. So in this pelvic brim, we are also looking at the region here. So this is the region of the pelvic brim that forms the inferior boundary. We we'll look at the components. In the posterior region, we have muscles, we have bones, there are vessels, arteries and veins. We have the fascia wrapping the muscles, and then we we'll look at the nerves. Of course, we have the layers of peritoneum, and then fat. We'll start with the bony component. If we remember the proximal point of this region, which we said it is the 12th rib. Now, from the 12th rib, as you can see in this image, we can, if we begin to run this tally, we'll look at all the lumbar vertebra from L1 to L5. And then this also goes with the intervertebral disc between each of the bodies of this vertebra. We also see the iliac bone 
that will form the pelvic brain. So these bones will form the bony components of the posterior abdominal region. The next focus will be the muscles. From these muscles, we'll look at them in two regions. We'll look at them from the region above the ilia crest. Now here is the ilia crest. And then in this other side, this is also the level of the ilia crest. So we'll consider the muscles that are above the ilia crest and then consider the muscles that are below the ilia crest. For muscles that are above the ilia crest, if you run from the medial part to the lateral part, we'll be looking at some of these muscles. The first one we're seeing here is the psoas major, followed by the next one lateral to the psoas major, and here is the quadratus lumborum, and then the layer lateral to the quadratus lumborum is the transversus abdominis muscle. If you come to the next group, we call the group below the ilia crest, we'll be seeing two muscles. We'll be looking at the distal extension of the Swiss major running inferiorly to its insertion and then lateral to it. We'll be seeing the iliacus, which is the muscle that we see forming the layer in the iliac fossa. We'll be talking about two major fascia in this posterior abdominal region. And the two major fascia we'll be considering are the thoracolumbar fascia. Here is the thoracolumbar fascia. That's the thoracolumbar fascia. And the next fascia we'll be looking at is the psoas fascia or the psoas sheet. In this diagram also, we can see the fascia covering the psoas major, which we call the psoas fascia or the psoas sheet. We'll be seeing a number of vessels basically some very large vessels. Top there is the abdominal aorta. And here we see the abdominal aorta as it entered through its opening in the thoracic diaphragm. The next big vessel in this region is the inferior vena cava. And finally, we'll be seeing some other smaller vessels like the zygous vein and the hemi-azygous vein. We have a number of nerves, the subcostal nerve and all the branches that be emanating from the lumbar plexus. They will also be seen in this area, forming the nerve component of this region. Our next focus will be to look at the muscles forming these regions, and then look at these muscles, understand their origin, their insertion, their action, and also the innervation. And topmost among these muscles is the psoas major. So here is the psoas major. This is the muscle. The muscle is fusiform in shape. That is the muscle I've, I'm running my light on. Running on top of it is the psoas minor muscle. But our focus here is the psoas major. Now, it is enclosed in a fascia which we'll be calling the, the psoas sheet. So the psoas sheet is a fascia wrapping around the psoas major muscle. This muscle will cover the anterolateral surface of the bodies of the lumbar vertebra. If you can pick up the lumbar vertebra along this region, this muscle will run from the anterior and the lateral parts of these bones. For its origin, psoas major will be picking origin from the T12 vertebra down to L1, L2, L3, L4, L5 vertebra. That's the origin. It will run through this whole length of vertebral bones from T12 to L5. And also, we have intervertebral discs between the bodies of these vertebral bones. So the muscle also picks origin from the intervertebral discs between them. In addition, it also picks origin from the transverse processes of the five lumbar vertebra. And now to its insertion. We see the muscle running distally and then running to the proximal part of the femur and then it will finally get inserted in a part of the proximal part of the femur that is called the lesser trochanter of the femur. That is where it's actually attaching. So from the origin T12 to L5 and to insertion which is the lesser trochanter of the femur. We'll look at the relations of Swiss major. From the site of origin, the muscle will be seen descending to the pelvic brain. That's this journey from here and then to this region of the pelvic brain. From the pelvic brain, it will enter the thigh 
this movement to the thigh. How does it enter the thigh? It will pass deep to the inguinal ligament. So the structure here is the inguinal ligament, and then we are picking the psoas major, running deep to the inguinal ligament. As it passes deep to the inguinal ligament, running to its insertion in the lesser trochanter of the femur, it will pass through the hip joint. As it does this, it will have a bursa, a synovial bursa, between it and the capsule of this joint. And then sometimes it is noted that there will be a communication between the joint and this synovial bursa, and sometimes there may not be these communications. So this muscle will run across the anterior surface of the hip joint as it runs to its insertion. In looking at more of the relations of psoas major, we will note the psoas major as a key muscle of the posterior abdominal region. And why do we say that? For two reasons. One, we see the lumbar plexus forming within the substance of the psoas major. It means that for us to be able to get to the root of the lumbar plexus, we'll be able to tear away a good part of the psoas major muscle. And we'll be seeing five nerves emerging from the underneath of this muscle from its lateral border and then here is the here is the psoas major and then we're seeing this part of lumbar plexus being formed within the muscle and then these branches exiting from its lateral border from above downward we'll be seeing the following nerves topmost we'll be seeing the subcostal nerve followed by the Ilo hypogastric nerve, and then the ilo ilingua nerve, then lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh, and finally the femoral nerve. The upper four nerves we talked about the subcostal, ilo hypogastric, ilo inguinal, and lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. All the four, all the four nerves here, I'm running my light, will be seen coming out from the point above the iliac crest, and then the, we see the the femoral nerve coming from the point below the iliac crest. The function of psoas major is hip flexion and also lateral flexion of the trunk. Its innervation is from the lumbar plexus and it will be coming from the L1 to L3 nerves. Before we get to the next muscle, we will look at the sheath that is covering the psoas major. Here is the psoas major muscle covered by its fascia which will now take to form the psoas sheet. Now this sheet has attachments both superiorly, laterally, medially and inferiorly. So look at the extent of this attachment. From the point above, we will see that this fascia will take to form a ligament which is called the medial acute ligament. Now, when we follow this fascia laterally, we we'll see that this fascia will blend with the anterior layer of the thoracolumbar fascia, which is the fascia we are seeing here. By the time we follow medially, we we'll see this fascia actually attaching to the lumbar vertebra and the intervertebral disc between the bodies of this vertebra. And then finally, by the time we follow it distally, we will be seeing this fascia fusing with the acute line of the pelvis and then this is the acute line of the pelvis here is the acute line of the pelvis so this psoas sheet will fuse with the acute line of the pelvis and the fascia covering the iliacus muscle which is called the iliacus fascia or the iliac fascia now we are done with psoas major we'll look at psoas minor now we had seen psoas minor earlier in this lecture. This is psoas minor again. Now this muscle is very well associated with psoas major. It's found lying on top of psoas major. A number of times this muscle is absent. It lies on the anterior surface of psoas major here whenever it is present. Now it's not as broad and large as psoas major. It's very slender and has long tendinous component. Now its origin is from T12 and L1, T12 and L1, and also the intervertebral disc 
between the vertebra. It will run with its long tendon to insert distally here at this point, which is the peritoneal line of the pelvic brain. That's this point here. And also, it will attach to this point between the ilium and the pubis, which is called the iliopubic eminence. So, point of insertion of Swiss minor is the peritoneal line of the pelvic brain and the iliopubic eminence. Now, for its action, Swiss minor is a weak flexor of the lumbar vertebra column, and for innervation, it is innervated by the same lumbar plexus, which is the anterior rami of the L1 nerve. We will be the next muscle, and this muscle is quadratus lumborum. Now, let's look at our chart again. Here we can still pick out the Swiss major, and lateral to the Swiss major, we'll be seeing the layer of muscle here. This layer of muscle, the middle lateral to the Swiss major, is called the quadratus lumborum, and I want us to also appreciate it in this picture. Here is the Swiss major again, and then lateral to it here is the quadratus lumborum, and then this a larger representation, that's the Swiss major here, and immediately lateral to it, that is the quadratus lumborum. Now, quadratus lumborum fills the space between the twelfth rib and the iliac crest on both sides of the vertebral column, and then this is the space we are referring to, that means we see quadratus lumborum filling this space we are seeing here. Is a muscle that fills the space that is actually left open here. It lies posterior to the kidney. This is the kidney. And then we see deep to the kidney, we are seeing a part of the quadratus lumborum. It also seems to be bordered laterally by this muscle here, which is the transversus abdominis muscle. So it implies that Medial to the quadratus lumborum, we'll be seeing the Swiss major, and then lateral to it, we'll be seeing the transversus abdominis muscle. The quadratus lumborum muscle picks origin from the L5 vertebra. So we pick here as our L5 vertebra, and then it also pick origin from the iliolumbar ligament. And then in our picture, here is the iliolumbar ligament. And then this ligament is the ligament connecting the ilium and then the lumbar vertebra. That's the ligament here. And then finally, it will also pick origin from the adjoining part of the iliac crest. So this is the part of the iliac crest. So this is the part of iliac crest very close to this region. So number one, again, we see the origin coming from here, the L5 vertebra, to the iliolumbar ligament here, and finally the adjoining part of the iliac crest. So this whole structure here is our quadratus lumborum. This muscle, after picking origin from this lower end of the body, will move upwards and then pick various points for insertion, beginning from L1 proximally to L4 distally. It also gives insertion at the inferior border of the 12th rib. For its insertion, we'll be seeing the 12th rib at its inferior border and then L1 to L4 vertebra. Its function is lateral flexion of the lumbar vertebra and we also see it stabilizing the 12th rib during respiration. The innervation is subcostal nerve which is T12 nerve and also lumbar nerves and these are branches L1 to L4. We'll be looking at iliacus muscle. This is the muscle we see covering the, the iliac fossa. The muscle is fan-shaped. In this our diagram, we can see the, this iliacus. And also in this other diagram, we can see the part of the iliacus, the medial part being covered by the Swiss major as it runs down to its insertion. Now, this muscle will fill the space of the iliac fossa on each side, one on the right and one on the left. Now the muscle will pass inferiorly to join with the Swiss major muscle. Here, remember this is the Swiss major. Now here is the iliacus. So both muscles will come together and they will run distally to that point of insertion of the Swiss major 
which is the lesser trochanter of the femur. So both the iliacus and then the lesser trochanter of the femur have a common insertion. So most times we see the name iliosoas, which is actually a combined name for this joint relationship that iliacus has with psoas major muscle as a run down to that common insertion at the lesser trochanter of the femur. So for the origin of iliacus muscle, we have it peaking origin from the upper to third of the floor of the iliac fossa. And here is the upper to third of the iliac fossa. And this is where we see the origin of the iliacus. And then also from the inner lip of the iliac crest, here is the iliac crest. And here is the medial lip of the inner lip. We also see its origin from the upper surface of the lateral part of the sacrum. And then here is the sacrum. And then we see part of this muscle peaking origin from this upper part of the sacrum. So here also is the bony representation. This is also part of the origin of the iliacus. For its insertion, we've noted that the fibers will converge on, on the lateral side of the Swiss major and will run with it to insert on the lesser trochanter of the femur. The nerve supply to the iliacus is femoral nerve and this nerve is L2, L3. The action is flexion of the thigh and this it does alongside with the psoas major muscle. So it will, along with psoas major, cause flexion of the thigh and the lumbar part of the vertebral column. Before we round off with this part of the lecture, we want to look at this fascia that covers a good part of the muscle that we see both from the back and then in the deep part of the abdomen. Now this fascia is the thoracolumbar fascia. Here again is the posterior aspect of thoracolumbar fascia. This fascia is an extensive fascia complex that we see attaching to the vertebral column. Now this fascia is also seen to have three layers and these layers are the anterior, the middle and the posterior layers. And what these la layers have done is to wrap around the various muscles seen at the back and then at the posterior lateral aspect of the trunk. This diagram here shows us the different layers of this tracolumbar fascia. Now also we see a number of muscles here is the thoracolumbar fascia. So we see this fascia enclosing a number of muscles within its layers. In this lumbar region, we see its three layers. One is the anterior layer here. The man we are seeing here is backing us, and then the, the anterior part is here. So we are seeing this layer here is the anterior layer. Now the layer here is the middle layer, and then the layer here is the posterior layer. And then we are seeing these muscles that are found between them. We should name them as we progress in the lecture. We will start with the posterior layer. Now recall that this here is the posterior layer. Here is the posterior layer. It extends from the 12th rib to the iliac crest. Runs from the 12th rib to iliac crest. And laterally, it will run to the internal oblique. And here is the internal oblique muscle. That's the internal oblique muscle here. This muscle will run laterally to the internal oblique muscle and also the transversus abdominis muscle, which is the muscle we have here. So we have this posterior part extending to these two muscles, the transversus abdominis and the internal oblique muscles. Now we also see it overlying some other muscles. Here we are seeing the latissimus dorsi, and then this layer also covers the latissimus dorsi muscle. Here is the middle layer. This is the middle layer of thoracolumbar fascia. We will see it enclosing a muscle, and this muscle is enclosed alongside with the anterior layer. So this middle layer and the anterior layer we enclose the muscle, and the muscle here is the quadratus lumborum. Now with this, with this posterior layer, the middle layer will also enclose another muscle, and the muscle being enclosed here 
is a muscle that is called the latissimus dorsi muscle. It also extends to the back and includes other muscles which are the corners of the back, like the rectus spinal muscle. For the anterior layer of the thoracolumbar fascia, here is the anterior layer, and then this layer is also called the quadratus lumborum fascia. We see it covering the anterior surface of the quadratus lumborum muscle here. It is thinner and more transparent than the other two layers here. This anterior layer will be seen attaching to the anterior surface of the transverse process of the lumbar vertebra, the iliac crest and the twelfth rib. Now the anterior layer is continuous laterally with the aponeurotic origin of the transversus abdominis muscle. It also thickens superiorly to form the lateral acute ligament. Remember, it is the thickening of the or fascia superiorly that gave rise to the formation of the median acute ligament. Here we are seeing the thickening of the anterior layer of the tracholoma fascia superiorly giving us the lateral acute ligament and is also adherent inferiorly to the iliolumbar ligament. This is where we end this part of the lecture. If you have questions, comments, or suggestions, please throw them in the comment section. The part two of this lecture will be on the vessels and nerves located in this region. If you consider this material helpful, we encourage you to subscribe, like the video, and share it to your friends that it will also be helpful too. And together, we we'll build a unique anatomy family where we make anatomy simple. So see you in my next video and bye for now.